Thai, and you're also part of the teaching committee. So thanks for both of the, the two things, Mark. Um, he also uh, published a lot of um, number of incredible number of papers in even in top journals, and he uh, also has been ranked number one in regional science and one of the top economists in the world, uh, as I said before. Uh, he is actually president of Regional Science Association International. Unfortunately, the the conference, the world conference, has been postponed to to the uh, next year. But but I think uh, we will will start again. And he's editor of a number of uh, of, uh, of journal in in regional science. He's co-editor of journal regional science, and uh, and uh, he's in editorial board of. Uh, really in impressive numbers of uh, journals. Uh, so the, the rules of the seminar, um, I think for those that have already attended the seminar, they know, but I will repeat the, the rules. So we have basically two kinds of questions that is possible to, to do. During the presentation, there are the possibility to have some clarifications on, on details, uh, details, slides, and, and so on. Um, and then uh, there is also the possibility to have questions just writing in the chat, uh, in the chat, and then we will we will allow for the people to to have questions. We also um, uh, um, broadcasting the the seminar on YouTube channel, and Benjamin is going to collect the the, the questions on on uh, on YouTube, and then uh, we, we will gonna ask to Mark Patrick here. Uh, the question coming from YouTube. Uh, so, uh, two uh, other preliminary stuff. First of all, um, uh, if you are not going to talk on on or during the presentation, it's better that you turn off the, the mic and the video, so the connection will be better. Uh, and then, since we are going to uh, record the presentation, uh, we need your consensus to, to record the presentation. So there is the possibility to, um, for those that doesn't want to, to share the consensus, to uh, uh, get out the, the, the webinar, the Meet Google Meet, and just uh, look at the presentation on YouTube. So it's possible to to doing both. Uh, so if you stay here, we we think that you are gonna get the consensus for for recording the the presentation. Um, so uh, I think I said everything. Alessandra Fajal, that is our director, is here. Um, I don't know if he wanna say something about uh, uh, something more. Uh, you said everything, but I just wanted to thank Mark for his continued support to our program. He was with us from the very beginning, from the you know the moment we I, I arrived in Italy and we changed the teaching committee. He was in it and he came every year ever since to teach for at least a week to our students who really enjoyed his teaching. And so, you know, obviously I'm sure they will uh, uh, enjoy this seminar uh, and hopefully he will be back next year for, for a full uh, uh, week of classes to our students. But really, thank you very much for your support and, you know, for for joining us and no i one thing i wanted to mention is that mark is also in um, involved uh, in our activity including also now we are launching a discussion paper series uh, and so he will be involved in that as well given his uh, uh, extensive editorial experience so thank okay. you very much okay so perfect the the um, title of the presentation is really um, important so it's it's uh, really contemporary just say uh, it's about covid-19 and implosion of regional economies so mark thank you very much so the floor is yours thank you well thank you uh, thank you marco thank you alessandra uh, as uh, was said uh, uh, my title is covid-19 and implosion of regional economies uh, i uh, I, this is some of my, uh, I've, we've done a little bit of empirical work that I'll talk about. Uh, this is some of my initial thoughts on how it's going to affect regional economies. So uh, it, it right now isn't a formal paper, but we hope to, we hope that that will change here, but suggestions would be uh, uh, very welcome. So just to, you know, from the, from the U.S. point of view, uh, uh, COVID has killed uh, nearly 100,000 people. 
and uh, that's that's uh, confirmed. Uh, there, if you look at uh, over deaths, where we have more deaths than normal, uh, it, it's it, numbers are thrown out of two hundred to three hundred thousand Americans have been killed, uh, which if, which would by far lead the world. Uh, pub, in terms of public health measures, they've been uh, kind of scatterbrained in the sense that. Uh, uh, Normally, in a national emergency in the United States, the president takes the lead. And in this national emergency, uh, the president uh, has been very vocal, but has left those decisions and uh, really let the governors make those decisions. And we have states that never close down, like South Dakota, Nebraska, and so on. And then we have uh, states that closed rather early, California, Washington, even here in Ohio. And now all the states are in the process of being relatively opened up by Memorial Day, with a few exceptions. So, uh, you know, we're almost, even though we still have many cases and we're still expected to do social distancing, uh, we're, we're taking a, a risk in that sense. Uh, so in terms of... Uh, the implosion here in the United States has been rather dramatic. Uh, through mid-April, we will be getting numbers through mid-May in early June. Uh, but through April, we had you know non-farm job losses through the official statistics were already 21 million people. Uh, I say uh, 37 million UI claims through mid-May. They just announced another number this morning of 4.4 million new claims. So that brings the total up in the United States up to uh, uh, 41 million, and so and there's uh, very some very wide uh, uh, disparities, and they're not for the most part uh, not driven by caseloads. About it isn't necessarily the disease that's driving it; it's more like uh, the governmental response to uh, the virus and uh, a little bit about their you know their economic composition and some of the things I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, uh, going on. So, uh, in terms of how this is regionally affecting places, uh, you'll see, if you look at the 50 largest metropolitan areas in uh, data from human resource firms, because they do the payroll, they've come out with, uh, uh, at least with small businesses, numbers uh, uh, ranging from 75% decreases in jobs to as low as 20% decreases in jobs. Uh, with most of the U.S. at its peak was around, for small businesses, around 55 to 60% decreases in employment. Uh, and, and so one of my points will be uh, small businesses, in particular with the U.S. policy response, really put a lot of the owner, owner, onerous on to small firms and then really hit them hard. And I want to talk a little bit about the long run costs of that. Uh, employment beginning around the 20th or so of April has slowly started picking up across the country, but we're, uh, but we're not talking about large numbers. We're still talking about uh, uh, decreases of, of most cities of well over 40% for small businesses and large businesses uh, you know, it depends what kind of business they have. Uh, they're probably not as large, but very large numbers. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about this shock and how it's manifested itself and how and, and then what are some of the outcomes that uh, we need a better job of understanding that I think are going to be most interesting, especially the regional science uh, and regional economics. So in terms of background, people have argued that this this is kind of a uh, you would people think that what's going on today is going to have long run impacts forever, and people have argued like media figures, uh, academics, public intellectuals that this pandemic will have mass will lead to massive changes in American society and so forth, and uh, you know I'm always a little skeptical of that. Uh, for example, in 1917 through 19, early 1920, you know, was the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu killed uh, many more Americans than what have been, have been killed by uh, COVID-19, and the country was much smaller. 
And then you, but you ask people who, who grew up, uh, who were born just 10 years or so later, they said nobody ever talked about it. It was you know, already forgotten. So I'm, I'm not as convinced that this is going to have be a monumental shift in the way people think. However, it's going to have massive, massive short-term economic effects uh, that could turn into long-term economic effects if policy responses aren't, uh, aren't sufficient. So, in, but in terms of those who think it's going to have ma major effects, I'll just note some of them. It's going to, it's hit in the United States, lower wage people. Uh, in terms of uh, job losses, estimates are around 40 to 50% of low-skilled Americans have lost their jobs. And the ones who are still working, uh, they receive very relatively small uh, hazard pay, if any. And of course, they're much more exposed to the disease, and so the burden has been disproportionately placed on lower income Americans, lower skilled Americans, and uh, they have also faced more of the economic burdens as well. Uh, the other feature I'll just note, because I uh, hope to come back and talk about that, is people will argue that cities are not going to look so attractive, and if, if, if in five years people have already forgot this, you know, then it's a, a moot argument. However, uh, my view is, is that, uh, uh, that in, in some ways, uh, perhaps cities have become more attractive in that, yes, disease does spread faster. Yes, cities were hit harder in this. But uh, one of the things that's come out of this is that larger shares of the workforce may be able to remotely work. And one of the, the probably, maybe the biggest disadvantage of cities is commuting, that you have these long, long commutes. And if people are, if this shock has allowed more people to work remotely, and that becomes more common, then that actually might make cities more livable. So uh, I'll talk more about that. So this shows uh, the loss in income. And this is uh, I apologize for the quality of the graphic because this is what the Cent U.S. Census Bureau has, but this shows. Um, okay, sorry, Mark. We yes, we, we just see the, the the first slide, so the title of the of the presentation. So, but uh, we cannot see. The, <sighs> okay. The, if you're going to. Yes, let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can help there. Do you have it now? Mm. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. So this, this, as I said, is the the map. Uh, uh, this is a uh, this is the result of uh, the U.S. Census Bureau has been surveying. I think it's around a hundred thousand people every week about their the impacts of uh, of uh, COVID and asking them various questions about well-being. And this just gives you a feel for uh, U.S. average is uh, around 41, 42 percent have households that somebody has lost a job. But I, one of the things I want to point out is, is that there's a great deal of spatial variation. In New York, not surprisingly, is over 50 percent. California is quite high because they really uh, shut things down. And then you get into states some of them really did lock down, like Montana really did lock down, but they have not experienced a lot of negative effects. South Dakota didn't lock down at all, uh, and they uh, haven't experienced many negative effects. But and so one of my point is, is it's not very necessarily, uh, it, it, it isn't necessarily related to caseload, though you can see it with New York, uh, and it's not fully related to whether you lock down or not. But there is an incredible amount of spatial variation there, and just to give you a feel for that, you know, this is a this this shows food security. I'm not, you know, the household saying I am not getting enough food, 
And those numbers on the U.S. average is around 12 percent right now. 12 percent of Americans are saying they have food security issues due to this. And so I'm just trying to give you a feel you know, for the severity of how this has been hitting, hitting Americans, in particular low-income Americans. And as far as on the business side, the Census Bureau is also every week surveying thousands of businesses uh, about the impact of COVID-19. And so this is their latest uh, one. It was data collected April 26th to May 2nd. And overall, how has your business been affected by the pandemic? The U.S. average, as it says there, is 51 percent. And you see a lot of spatial variation there that uh, you know, right. there's states that are over 75 percent of them. Right. Are, yes. So, sorry. Could, could you please uh, put the presentation uh, style so we can we can see in this way the better a better picture? Because if you take the presentation in this way, we sh the, the map is are not that. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's going to be probably the best I'll do with these maps. I have better. The presentation should be clear in a second. But this was the Census Bureau is not. <laughs> they can give me the best quality stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, but uh, we can see. Sorry, Mark. We can see the map. But what what I think Marco is just trying to say is you are not in presentation mode in PowerPoint. Yeah. You know? So we see the whole screen. We see the whole screen, but you are not. There is a button at the at the bottom of the screen to go in presentation mode, so that you can switch the slides, go through the slides. Otherwise, we we are stuck on the full screen. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So the bottom, you know, where it's we can see the whole screen, right? And it we can see. I'm presenting. If, ah, if you're, you're not option presenting. is stop presenting. No, 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 no. But yeah. on your on your screen. On yeah. your power and power slides, see where it says apply to all. At the bottom of that, there is an icon. If you okay. click on that one, okay. it should be able to show the presentation. So go in presentation mode. It says I'm in presentation mode. But we just see the, the slides number five. What we are looking at now is is a uh, slide number five. We can see your slides but, going through. Uh, it basically, it, we only see the slide number five and not six, seven, or whatever. Do you see the entire screen? Uh, Matt, if you prefer, you can send to me, and I can try to share. Um, my screen and and you you just uh, uh, okay talk okay about about which kind of slide do you want to to show and then I I move for you okay that looks like uh, what we'll have to do so Marco I will send you by email if you send me by email I can try to okay share. I apologize that's no problem we have plenty of time we have two hours so even if we go a little bit longer on the first <laughs> part it's not a problem. But it's better so that actually we can see it better, otherwise it gets stuck. So once you have sent the email to Marco, you have to stop your presentation mode because now it says Mark Partridge is presenting and so Marco can then starts yeah. the, the presentation for you and then you just say to him you know change slides or whatever and he will do it for you okay. it, ha it happened before don't worry <laughs> <laughs> it happened at least a couple of times all right are you ready marco not yet. Did you did you send by mail, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got it. Okay. 
just a second that I share my screen. When you get there, I am on slide uh, 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 seven. Just a second. Okay, can you see the presentation now? Yes, we can. So okay. try to see if going, yes, we can. This is background? Yeah. We were here at, at slide five, Mark. Seven, he said. Go to seven. seven. Overall, okay. how the business. Okay. okay, perfect. Okay, so as I pointed that out, there's a, a you know differences in color where 51% have said that they're uh, quite negatively affected. I mean, they, they ask you, you know, differing degrees, and, and, and it's 51% or you know, largely or are, are totally affected by uh, then, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, last week, last week, did this, it, it asked more questions, but this is the one that I think is going to determine what, you know, which regions are going to come out of this faster, uh, whether we're talking about countries or nations is, uh, in the last week, did this business have disruptions in the supply chain? And the national average was 45% of businesses said, yes, we did have disruptions to the supply chain. Yes, again, you can see uh, differences in color of the, uh, of the states representing uh, uh, West Coast states in particular having disruptions. But this is going to be, this is the problem that we're going to have coming out of this thing is it's, a core, it's the same coordination issue you do you have in any other recession or depression is that you'd be willing to open up and hire and uh, and and do everything if you know that you can get your suppliers and you know that your customers are ready and as long as the supply chain's messed up then businesses are going to lack confidence that they should fully open up because of, of uh, their supply chains messed up they don't know if their customers are ready and it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy uh, fallacy of, of you know one of those fallacy composition things that everybody's going to stay close so right now you know we've seen regional variation in the supply chain uh, going to the next slide across industries uh, this is the effect across the US and I want to focus on the final column that shows uh, the percent change in, to in employment, and this is this starts with total employment in March and April, and like I said, we're going to get May data at the first week in, in, in June, and it shows like total U.S. employment has fallen almost 15% uh, since February. Uh, and what I want to point out is, is this on, on this slide, it's not the normal recession in that the normal recession is typically manufacturing it's a it's a durable good it's a thing that people quit buying first construction you you, you just you you quit doing construction and you see that uh, with the exception of automobiles it, they're below the average uh uh they're 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 below it's not acting like a, a normal uh a normal kind of uh, of a recession in that sense switching the next slide uh, this shows that the other one is is that even though uh, retail trade, many stores were closed and, and, and so forth, it's so far, uh, it's, it's not concentrated in retail trade. Uh, it's slightly below the average of 15%, of, of retail trades of 14%, while temporary help services, of course, are being hit really hard. Going to the next slide, this is where, uh, this is where it is. It's leisure and hospitality, and that is uh, you know, a big industry, uh, and that's over half of, of the workforce has been laid off in that, and that hits particular states really hard, Las Vegas and Nevada. Nevada is basically a tourism-oriented economy, and it's been hit particularly hard, as I'll show you, and uh, Hawaii is another one, and it's just very high unemployment. Other services... Are, are things that uh, also uh, shut down. These are things from anything from your 
uh, from health clubs to uh, you know beauty salons to nail nail places and so forth. They've also been hit really hard. Uh, then uh, uh, the one in blue I want to focus on is state and local government. And uh, uh, right now, uh, state and local governments are facing massive decreases in tax revenue. And in our federal system, they collect the taxes. You know, they receive some government funding from the federal government, the central government, but uh, state and local governments have lost up to 5% of their employment, and they're going to start laying off on the order of, of, of millions of people. Already state and local governments have laid off nearly a million people just through April, and we're going to start seeing massive cuts in state and local government if something isn't done about that. And that's been uh, the complaints about the U.S. Uh, stimulus. A lot of money has gone, almost over $3 trillion has been sent out the door from Washington. However, where it's gone has been not necessarily in places that was going to have the most effect. So uh, going to slide uh, 12, this shows you know, state employment. I'm going to skip it. Uh, this would just be the early picture of states, and you know there were, you know there are states that you know through March were still gaining employment, and then since then have stopped. Where I want to jump to, where we do have better data, is unemployment insurance claims, more timely data. And as I said, we just got another report this morning with another 4.4 million people making claims. But this shows, you know, this this shows the spike on on slide 13 that you have, you notice it's like a flat line. That's basically go going back to February or going back into 2019, it was 200,000 a week. We're claiming uh, unemployment insurance every week, 200,000, 200,000, 200,000, 200,000. Then a little blip the first week of May, and then boom, uh, two weeks of 7 million people each week claiming unemployment insurance. And when I note that, that's, that's rather remarkable for the U.S. because – you know, not only is it 35 times what it had been just earlier in March, but our unemployment insurance system, the normal standard UI system, only covers about 30% of the people who are unemployed. So the fact that you're getting this, this many unemployment insurance claims is, is rather remarkable. Another remarkable thing is, is in our de very decentralized government, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, is that states states have each state manages the unemployment system, and some states like California take it very seriously. Then you have other states that you know actually it's set up by uh, Republican governments who are trying to deter people from signing up for unemployment insurance. You know, under the, you know, the normal arguments, it makes people lazy, they won't go out and search for jobs. And, it, and so in states like even Ohio or in Florida, it, it just, it, it, it took six, seven, six, it, it, one of the reasons why unemployment insurance claims are still so high is you can't get through to the state government. And so uh, uh, the, the systems are just dilapidated uh, unemployment insurance systems in some states, like Ohio, are using COBOL. And I went to, I started college, university in 1981. And when I was taking computer programming, COBOL was already an old program then. And we have, uh, we have unemployment insurance claim systems in many, many states that are running it off a COBOL program from the, from the 1970s. So, you know, they were obviously overwhelmed. Point is, you know, the, our response has really varied. And, and we have, so we have a lot of unhappy people because they're, they're not getting any money. They're not getting any relief. Well, in other states, it's been working much better. This shows probably the best view of how hard a state's been hit. So what, what we did here, this is the next slide, 14 is that we added up all of the unemployment insurance claims across states going back to March 14th. And March 14th was a small, a small bump in unemployment insurance claims. Uh, 
uh, and uh, then each week, you know, I already I told you. So what we did is we had a 314, 321, 328, you know, March 21, March 28, and so on. And uh, uh, this shows that uh, some states like South Dakota, uh, they, their, theirs is only run just over 9% of their labor forces have applied for unemployment insurance. And uh, why then you have other states like Hawaii, where the number is over 35% of their labor force have applied for unemployment insurance. And that number is almost as high in Nevada. And I'm not counting this week's numbers that, that just got released this morning. And so what you see is it's just massive dispersion across the country in what places have been hit. You know, general story, the plain states, the middle of the country not being hit very hard. And then just kind of scattered, uh, depending on whether how much tourism you have, or do you have a, a composition of industries where you couldn't remote remotely work, and and then you get a state like Michigan, uh, where that's the center of the U.S. auto industry, and the U.S. auto industry just totally shut down. They shut down in late March, and just it was just this week that they've been trying to open up. And they opened up again this week, but nonetheless, that industry is concentrated in in was in Michigan, and that means the suppliers shut down, the assembly plants shut down, and then uh, you know other input output spillovers. And this week they just opened them up again, and already they're shutting them back down because you know people uh, uh, people are falling ill. Uh, so uh, switching to the next slide. This shows within the state of Ohio, and I didn't pick Ohio because I'm in my beloved uh, Columbus, Ohio right now. I picked Ohio because Ohio is the only state that reports unemployment insurance claims by county. And so I list there, what I show there, the next the slide 15, is uh, uh, the state of Ohio, and I list the eight biggest cities, and I put in dark black, their metropolitan areas, which is basically uh, a labor market area, it's a commuting area, how the U.S. determines metropolitan areas. And what I want to show you is, is, is that, first off, you see outside of those metropolitan areas first, I want to note that you go up into the northwestern part of Ohio, very rural, and you see not very much unemployment. Uh, then you go down to the southeastern part of the Ohio, very rural, and you see unemployment that's as high as 36%. And so it's not necessarily, it's, what I'm trying to say, it's not some sort of rural-urban split. It's, it's really, we're trying to give you this, it's really idiosyncratic. So even within the state of Ohio, you have massive differences. In terms of the cities, uh, it really depended upon do you have a composition of your workforce that can remotely work? And the one that, that did the most is, uh, is, is uh, Cincinnati and, and Columbus, the heart of their metropolitan areas. But uh, 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 once like Youngstown, which is our hardest hit city in the state of Ohio, it, uh, it, 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 it's, it's basically heavy manufacturing. And so as far as the city got hit, they were hit rather hard. So point is, a lot of spatial variation in this. Let's go to the next slide, because uh, I want to talk a little bit, one other feature that, that really, that's, that's potentially very concerning to me, is that, uh, is what's happening to small firms and new firm startups. And in the U.S., like yeah. most, most uh, uh, countries, uh, advanced countries, developed countries, the uh, the, uh, uh, the bulk, the, a disproportionate share of our employment is in small firms. And the way we define small firms was less than 50 workers. And the other feature of the U.S. is that a disproportionate share of our new of our new jobs come from new firm startups. So in other words, large firms are not contributing a lot. And what I want to show, and then this shows you know a real variation. The small firm employment share varies a lot against uh, across the country. 
I can spend a lot of time talking about why it varies a lot across the country. In my beloved state of Ohio, we have the, some of the lowest shares of employment in small firms. And basically, one of the things that's always said about the state of Ohio is our manufacturing tradition is, is it got what that got wiped out of our DNA and we just don't do entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, new firms, it's a similar uh, it's a similar pattern of of uh, this basically the same states that have a lot of small firms also tend to have a lot of uh, new firms, and it's particularly low in, in my part. So now I want to say, well, what's been happening during this COVID crisis? Have we seen a lot of new firm startups? And so. The U.S. Uh, in the U.S., one of the things you typically have to do when you start a business is you apply to, and I know this is uh, you have to fill out this form to the Internal Revenue Service. To the that's slide 17, and it, and it's not important that you can really read it at the moment, but it's just asking basic questions about uh, your business. Uh, how many workers do you plan on having? When when did you start working? And the reason why you have to fill out this form is, is that when you start hiring workers, you have to start paying payroll taxes right away. And so, and one of the things to be able to pay payroll taxes is you need an employment identification number. And this form is the form you have to fill out to say, I'm a new firm, I'm gonna start paying payroll taxes. So going to the next slide, every week, the U.S. Census Bureau gets from the U.S. Internal Revenue Service who filled out these forms. And what this shows is on slide 18, it shows that uh, it shows two kinds of applications. And there could, there could be a union where you have both. The first one is business applications from corporations. In that corp if you incorporate then you're more likely to employ workers. You're more, you're more likely than if you don't. In particular, you know, the limited liability reasons is why you, the advantage of incorporation, it's a little, you know, you have to fill out some paperwork and so on. And then the other is uh, what they call high propensity business applications where they must, where the Census Bureau must have did like a LOGIT or a PROBIT study to find out, well, if you fill out that form and you answer certain questions, you have a high propensity of, of employing workers in the future. So what this shows is, is the number of that. And so, like, for example, the very first one, that would be February 1st, that's a number for both of them, it says 6% is, is where it is. And that means compared to February, the first week of February in 2019, in 2020, there were 6% higher applications for new firms and corporations that week. And you can see it is kind of bouncing around, usually a little bit above zero, reaching uh, in the first week of March, 14% above where we were in 2019. And then you can see the crash. And at its peak, uh, it was 38% below in, in uh High propensity business applications, those will likely employ people, and in corporations fell 44%. And you see, you see recovery, but we're still talking about 13% uh, in the high propensity businesses that are still down. What, what I'm getting at, it's why I've spent some time there, is we're talking about a large number of new businesses that weren't started. And since they're disproportionately going to create jobs in the future, you know, I know I'm talking to people who have uh, studied a lot of entrepreneurship. There are also the, 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 also the firms that are going to be most prone to do innovation and all sorts of other things. Uh, they have the highest job multipliers. They create the most jobs locally and so on. And the question I have is in terms of our future health, did our, is this all of this is, is this just a delay you know, okay, we're opening back up. I was going to apply for my new business, uh, but I'm now going to, you know, I have to wait a couple months. Or is it is it going to have a permanent effect where people say, God, I wanted to open up a business, but not in this economic environment. And I'm a little worried it's going to be more the latter because uh, there are, you know, you know, depending on the industry, 
there's been estimates of up to 30 percent of restaurants will never reopen in the United States. And so I'm really uh, concerned that this is going to have long run effects on our innovation. And I think uh, what I'm getting at is I think entrepreneurship is researching entrepreneurship, how it was affected by this crisis will be really important because it's having such a disproportionate effect on those kind of firms and small firms and startups where that's that's what we need to have to start the, the job uh, growth. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, what I want to show you, I know that's a busy, a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, and I and this is uh, my the Midwest, uh, my part of the world. And in black is the line I just showed you in high propensity. And so basically you can look at that and you can see how these states were relative to the US. And here in the Midwest, we were typically a little bit below in orange at the very bottom is Illinois. And at one time they were at 50% below and they have not recovered very much. They're still well over 20%. Here in Ohio, we've, we got hit hard, but we've, uh, 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 recovered. And, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is this really varies across regions. And that's what, you know, a lot of us are interested in is in spatial kinds of issues. Uh, that's corporations. This I wanted to mention, I know it's really busy, but this is kind of these East Coast states that people, especially speaking to a lot of Europeans, you, one would tend to focus on. And you see New York's in orange and New York is just not recovered. They're just not applying for businesses at all. They're, they're uh, almost uh, uh, 30 points below the U.S. average, 25 points below the U.S. average. And, and uh, it is in particular, uh, New York really got hit hard. And uh, the last one is, I'll just briefly mention, in the Southeast, black lines the U.S., that's slide 22. And what, so this is southeastern states, so southeastern US, uh, Atlantic coast states. And so we're going from Florida to Virginia and along the U.S. coast. And this shows, geez, they're, they're way above the U.S. average. You know, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't all that affected at all. And so it looks like the southeast in general, looks like the southeast and the plain states uh, are going to come out of this really quick. And the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West Coast are going to be, you know, lingering, 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 lingering. Uh, okay, so quickly, I want to give you uh, just a little bit of empirical work that we've been doing. And I want to present uh, just some simple models because I'm trying to find, is one of the things, I, like I said, I'm really interested in these small businesses. What's happening to them? And so what we did, this is slide 23, is we estimated a unemploy weekly unemployment insurance model. In other words, how many claims were there? And we got data for U.S. states going back every week, January 1st, 2019, all the way up through May 16th uh, today. And then for Ohio counties, we can now get, we get little places and big places, only in Ohio we can do this. 88 counties, and we have data for this year, every week. And we basically are estimating a change in unemployment insurance claims every week, the change. And, you know, like I'm trying to difference out the fixed effect. And, I, and then we have an indicator for after March 15th. And why March 15th? Every piece of this data, unemployment insurance claims, small business employment, March 15 was the day that across the country, that's when everything hit the fan. And, 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 and it was basically two days after the president declared a national emergency. And, and really, that was when the, the country as a whole said, ooh, this is coming to the United States, uh, where you know, for the most part, we thought this was something that the public had thought it wasn't coming. Okay, so we have an indicator for that. After that, then we have a bunch of variables that uh, we just enter. Every uh, we just enter the share of employment and manufacturing and all the industries. Basically, 
the 2019 share in all the industries. Uh, we enter, you know, do you have, and I'll, I'll talk about this more in a second, you know, the kind of uh, firm sizes you have, uh, some quite, you know, things like college graduates, uh, you know, university graduates everywhere else, uh, percent high school graduates and so on. And, and I expect that to be zero. I don't expect those things to have any effect. But the next one is what I'm interested in. That is a uh, an interaction of post-March 15 with those variables, then some time dummies. And then I'm going to talk about the third set of regression real quick is I'm going to talk about the 50 largest U.S. cities, like I've already talked about them, their daily employment, like March 1st, how many people were working at, at small firms by this one particular company that puts out uh, – uh, human resource software to pay employees, uh, how many workers were on payrolls divided by the average they had in the month of January. So if it comes in at 0.6, that means you're 40% below where you were in January. And those numbers varied from 0.2, you're 20% below January, to as high as 0.75 and even 0.8, 80% uh, were off. And we're basically estimating that model uh, we're estimating that model as uh, uh, the same thing. We have a post-March 15 in indicator. We have all the controls. Then we have the in indicator variable interacted with uh, 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 interacted with the uh, X variables. And then we have uh, uh, metropolitan area fixed effects. So uh, just I won't go through the results. Basically, the uh, counties, the, in the county data, not surprisingly, here in Ohio, the ones, you know, maybe you know, I'll jump to that. Let's jump to slide 28. No, uh, slide 31. This one? Sli uh, 31. 31. Okay, I can see a. This is this one, Mark. Is this one, Mark? I don't because know. I can, I, I can is it, see is it a busy? Is it a table? Okay, let me let me thirty one. Yeah, yes. This one. Is okay. it a table? Is this one? It's a table. Okay. So in the first, uh, you know, we do, we have other models, and but I, you know, I, I just want to go over the full one just briefly, and it shows. So the first column is growth in state unemployment claims or changes every week for all the U.S. states in the District of Columbia. Next one's the 88 Ohio counties. The third column is the 50 the employment at small firms for the 50 largest U.S. metropolitan areas, and they they would range from. Uh, I think the smallest is 1.1 million, and and the largest in terms of population, the largest being New York, is 19.2 million uh, metropolitan area. And what it shows is, first off, our once we add all these all these variables, the the, the indicator for being past March 15. Uh, is insignificant. But the one I really want to focus on is looking at the first column. Got a lot of multicollinearity. If you, uh, but uh, uh, looking at the first column, uh, what did I want to focus on? E No, let me do this. Let me do the second column. Uh, focusing on the second column, which is counties, you know, states that had agriculture had fewer. Let's go to the next slide, 32. This one is, is 32. Yep. Okay. Yep. 32. So this shows some other industries, and basically you see other services. Other services, big positive coefficient there on column two. 
the old, you know, if you had, you know, that, that those are things like uh, personal services for people, hair, you know, hair, uh, hair salons and massage parlors and so forth, so forth. You got hit really hard. If you had accommodations, you really got hit hard. And one of the things is management services. So that's an imp- that's a that's basically things that provide professional services to businesses. And since all these businesses closed down, those places, that's a supply chain effect. So in other words, they're not, you know, they were not first, but then once the other businesses started closing down, they were second. If you go back up to slide uh, 31 for a second, 31. you see manufacturing near the bottom, you see construction statistically insignificant. Ohio is a very manufacturing state. Traditionally, like I've said, manufacturing gets hit first and hit hardest in recessions. That's that's just not the case. Uh, this is a services recession. And and uh, 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 let's go to slide thirty three. Okay, this is thirty five. In Ohio, in Ohio, despite of what I said, uh, small firms, if you have a higher share of employment in small firms, that is employment from zero to 19 workers. Then I have 20 to 49, which is pretty small, uh, 50 to 249, and 250 to 499. If you have shares in those, if you have small firms where the admitted category is large firms, more than 500 workers, uh, you actually had fewer uh, unemployment insurance claims. Now, that varied by state. And one of the things that happened that's going to be a a real good research project is uh, in terms of evaluating. In Europe, most European countries, at least the way I understand it, did payroll support that the that the central government directly gave firms the money to pay workers uh 80 to 90 to maybe even 100 percent of what the worker got here in the united states that that was viewed as as communistic and so the way it was set up was you borrowed money from the federal government uh through the federal reserve and you basically could then write off how much you paid your workers. And so for the small firms, it was called Payroll Protection Program, PPP. You basically could borrow your payroll. If your payroll is $100, you could borrow $100. And you could then borrow up to 250% of your payroll. You could borrow up to $250. And if you can your workers on employed, that hundred dollars would be written off. You would not have to pay that part of your loan back. You'd only have to pay the part above your payroll. And that has been that's been a really clunky program in some states. It has really varied across states. In some states, they did a fantastic job. One of the reasons why South Dakota and Montana look so good right now is those those states really performed this PPP really well. And a lot, you know, a lot of that has to do with the kind of banks they have. And I have little tiny banks that just, that they really want to do this right. And then in the other states, like uh, they didn't do a very good job. And so small firms really varied where, what part of the U.S. you're in, in terms of whether you got services, serviced or not. So in Ohio, we actually, our banks did pretty well. Uh, okay. And but I'm going to get to where that doesn't look so well in just a second. So let's go back to slide 31. This is data. This is data for uh, on column three. This was the percent change in employment that you had. As I was describing the 50 largest metropolitan areas, I'll be real quick because my time is almost done. But I just want to note that a uh, negative number is bad, less employment. So big cities, less employment. Uh, uh, manufacturing. In cities, manufacturing meant less employment. And the reason why 
even though nationally is that in the cities, the largest cities, U.S. manufacturing tends to be more concentrated in rural areas, but I'm looking at the 50 largest cities. In cities, manufacturers were typically told to shut down because uh, that was a concentration of workers. Where that was not the case in small cities and in rural areas, they were critical infrastructure, they generally could keep working, and, and so in, in, we get a different result there. Going to slide 32, uh, you know, if you, the real estate sector, uh, banking, outside of small business lending, which I just talked about because of this PPP program, uh, your finance and insurance companies, you know, they're not selling insurance now, uh, got hit fire. Uh, 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 but if you had a lot of professional services, that's people who can work remotely. Those are consultants and 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 uh, patent attorneys and so forth. You had higher employment, uh, arts and entertainment, lower employment, uh, information, which surprisingly, information industries really got hit hard because not necessarily, you know, yeah, you think information could work in, in this situation. However, their client couldn't. So they lost a lot of employment. And then now getting to where I was really interested in was small firms. And this would be slide 33 again. And slide 33, column three. Now we're getting, if you had a lot of employment in small firms, your employment fell a lot, uh, zero to 19. You got a little bump from 20 to 49. I think the difference is, is that's, a, that's an institutional characteristic of the US in that this PPP program, if you're really small, like my wife has a small business, she's so small, there's no way she could go through, wait for six weeks to get loan money. Uh, she just shut down. Uh, but if you have over 20 employees, you're more likely to have enough working capital to survive a few weeks before the money came from this big loan and you kept on your workforce. And then as you got bigger, uh, the, you got bigger, it, it, you know, 50 to 249, they had laid off more. But for the most part, large businesses weren't hit so hard. And so in cities in particular, Small firms got hit hard. So if you're gonna, if one's gonna study, it's gonna vary a lot depending on how successful this program was. It's gonna be an interesting thing to, to research this PPP program because it really varied about how fast they got the loans out, eight by state, uh, and uh, it's gonna really vary that city small firms really got hit hard, and in, in, in elsewhere they did not. Okay, so that's some of my opening remarks i don't have time to talk about uh musing about uh some of the things what are some of the long-term effects i did already say i i don't think covid 19 is going to be something that outside of uh, a place like milan or maybe part, parts of new york city uh, you're not it's people aren't going to be talking about it in six seven years it's just going to be kind of something that people forgot. In, in, in American, you know, it's going to be it's going to become what nine eleven. You know, it seemed so big at the time, but over time, you know, people moved on. And in that, I don't expect this to have major effects, with one possible exception, and that is uh, the the income group that got hit really hard, even harder than what they normally get hit in a downturn was low was low skilled workers because not only do they have low skills and firms don't hoard low skilled workers during recessions, but they got the double whammy is they couldn't work remotely. So they, they got hit on both ends. And they were, if they were working, they were concentrated among other workers and they paid, they got, they got exposed to COVID more. And they, in, in, in particular, one has to wonder how long they may want to put up with that kind of, you know, because our low income workers in the United States have faced declining wages going back uh, to the late 1970s. So uh, that that group might, you know, there might, one could see some institutional changes, 
However, I don't, I don't see, I, I th actually, I think that's going to be unlikely in the end, uh, but that would be the one that I would expect most. I uh, hope that, okay, I'll stop there. Uh, I thank you for uh, listening in, and uh, I gladly take some questions here. Okay. Uh, we, we, we have a five-minute break, just because um, we are doing fine, so, if, okay, I can stop with sharing my screen. Uh, so if you agree, Mark, we can have five minutes break. Yep. And then we can see in five minutes and we start with the uh, debate. Okay. And, and the questions, okay? Thank you. Questions, okay. Yeah. Oh, we just wait. I think that people are just taking a break, maybe grab a coffee or something. We are doing it um, just to wind down a little bit. And now we are going to start with the question. Marco just left. I'm going to go and get myself a coffee as well. If you want to do the same, I don't know. Okay, okay. And then just five minutes just to grab a coffee. Okay. We, can do the, we can do the debate with coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will do. I got my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I love New York. <laughs> when we could yeah. go to New York without any yeah. trouble. We, we didn't see New York actually because, <laughs> because I, I was missed that part. But <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I got some, some water. I oh, know, I got coffee. Yeah. <laughs> 
Italian coffee in an American cup. Now we wait for ah. them to come back. <laughs> Okay, Mark. If you want, we can we can start. We already have two people that would like to um, raise some questions. The first one is Alessandra Kajan, then Ugo Rossi, uh, then uh, I don't know who else would like to, to make questions. But I also have some questions for you. So, Alessandra, if you would like to, yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I have a few thoughts, questions, comments, I don't know how you want to call them, but all very quick, and some of them, I guess, are more curiosity than other. Uh, I, I do like your point that this is a service recession, because, you know, it's, I think it's becoming quite clear in Italy as well, we're a little bit, let's say, ahead of the curve compared to the, to the US, and really, it is really clear. Uh, restaurants, uh, stuff like that, but uh, also we are talking a lot about the Tourist, a tourism sector, because of for obvious reason. So any kind of uh, sector where it's very difficult to create some kind of barrier or social distancing, and you know, think about the hairdresser or whatever, right? It is more difficult. Uh, so on these, uh, I'm curious about what you think. Do you think that this crisis it's more or less concentrated in terms of sectors that it's hitting than the 2009 crisis? Because, you know, it's completely different. And I'm just wondering if there is more or less concentration, if it's just a similar concentration, so same number of sectors, but in, in a different area, so manufacturing, finance uh, uh, services. That, that's the first one. Um, then this is more, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm going to pick on your brain on this. Do you think that if the crisis, the COVID crisis, had not started in Italy, but say in Germany or the UK, a country that normally has more credibility with the US, the US would have taken this more seriously faster. Because, you know, my, my feeling is that everybody here in Italy was just shouting and saying, look, lockdown is really bad. And everybody was like, eh, it's Italy, you know. Uh, they, it's it's, it's going to be their crisis, but it's never going to hit us. So I was just wondering if you thought about this issue of the credibility. Um, okay, then just a very tiny uh, comment. You said that the states that performed better in the PPP were states like Montana, South Dakota. Now, it struck me that these are actually states with low density of population, especially Montana, right? 
So isn't it a matter of uh, it's easy when you have fewer people than say you know New York or or Milan even Lombardy where of course they are overwhelmed because of the sheer population size. And the last thing is uh, uh, in your regression, did you have the art sector? Arts, okay, and it was insignificant, right? No, it was significant. Oh, it's significant. In, in, in the <clears throat> Okay, then I, I right. just didn't see. It was uh, in in the oh. metropolitan one. It was it was big, and 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 that's been one. It, you really, you can really see that. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. No, in, sorry. In uh, then, then it was my mistake. I thought it was insignificant. Oh, I, I was wondering if it was insignificant, if it was a matter of. Uh, I can I can share the the presentation. The if you would like to see the numbers, Mark. Uh, uh, near the oh. end. I think it was page thirty-three. Okay, can I move on? No, uh, the next one. I'm sorry, uh, the one before that. This one. After yeah. Uh, entertainment. Okay, yep. so yeah, sorry, so I was see, just focusing on the one in the middle, but actually it is when you look at the percentage change in the number of hourly employees in the metropolitan areas. Yes, so in the 50 metropolitan areas. Yes, yeah, so and, more and cities. Yeah, that, because that, this it, is... This is what we're talking about a lot, right? The, the arts and entertainment, tourism, and these kind of sectors, and all the um, sectors which are linked to tourism. For instance, the wine sector here has been hit very hard in Abruzzo because with all the restaurants closed down, now, well, you don't sell wine anymore, even though, you know, there is this thing going on that Italian on lockdown, they were drinking a lot, apparently not that much, or not enough to compensate for all the restaurants that were closed. Uh, anyway, these were just my thoughts. I don't know if you want to just answer. Well, the first thing I, I'll note that Americans picked up the slack. Our drinking has uh, greatly is greatly increased. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> a lot of people drinking before noon. Uh, the uh, go, taking your question in reverse is I'm glad you raised the PPP program. Uh, and why it worked better in certain states. And you're right that not entirely, but it did work well in small, in, in these smaller, less populated states, but it for the reasons you thought, at least that's my impression. And this gets it, but it gets at a thing that us regional scientists talk about a lot. Uh, in the US, we have a very unique banking system where because of the way the banks were regulated, all the way up until about 20 years ago, it was really hard to have banks across state borders. And so we developed a lot of little tiny banks. And so we still have over 7,000 banks in the United States. And so the small banks really wanted to deliver this. And so the little states have all these little banks. And so they really, you know, saw our opportunity to get loans and everything, you know, business with 10 people. Wow, that's a big business to us at a little bank. Well, while here, let's say here in Columbus, we're dominated by these large national or regional banks, and they could care less about these little businesses. Unless you had a business relationship with them, they just blew you off in this program. And that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of, a lot of frustration with the program is that if you lived in, a, in, a, in the cities with the large banks, they blew you off. And so that was that was why and it comes down to uh, you know, that question we always say, and this this shows it. Uh, I mean, this this is going to be kind of an experiment. Of that is, as we always talk about one of the problems small businesses have is that they have a lack of financing, and this could be a natural experiment where in places they actually got pretty good financing, and other they didn't. So I'm glad you raised that question. Uh, the next question is in terms of. In terms of concentration, I think we're headed towards a service recession that it's going to be pretty heavily concentrated in services, much more than normal. However, uh, if it lasts much longer, just because the nature of manufacturing, durable good orders are the things people will put off, uh, they're not going to want to buy a brand new house. I mean, we're going to start seeing the traditional recession if that uh, if, uh, if it lingers long enough. But in its early stages, it's going to remain a service recession because the supply chain, if you, the supply chain and services has been utterly, just utterly disrupted. And then the you know, 
third question, I forgot what was the one. What was the, the credibility? If it started in Germany, oh. rather than uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think maybe the answer is yes. In the terms of with American policymakers, they would probably take the current, especially our federal ones, uh, the, I'm sorry, the president and the administration. And, and members of Congress, they probably would take uh, Germany and Britain more seriously. But in terms of the public health community, their comments, uh, they were being interviewed a lot, and their comments were, this, is, this must be pretty bad because Italy's medical system is, is, is pretty good. This, isn't, this, isn't, this is a pretty good medical system, and if it's getting overwhelmed so quickly, we better, you know, we've we got a problem here. And so you're right that policymakers probably didn't take it as seriously, but the public health community knew that if, if it overwhelmed Italy, it, it, it certainly would over, could potentially overwhelm a private, where we have private health, uh, we don't have any spare capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay, we, uh, sorry Hugo, we have a, we have a question that comes from YouTube that is very related to this one. Uh, so I anticipate this one and then I leave you to have a question, Hugo. Okay, Gustavo Aumuda from the YouTube streaming has a question related to the technical issue. Heterogeneity of different sectors in the United States, like uh, for instance, agricultural, manufacturing services and so on, in function to human capital. Is it necessary to include an indicator to capture the intensity of human capital by sector? From YouTube, so that you know, the, uh, would is the problem with okay? The answer is yes, because I would expect. I mean, I mean, in terms of the expectation of an effect, then I'll come back to the econometrics. In that, yes, that the service sector. In these rural, in a, we have all these rural states or in small places, tends to be, have a lower education uh, intensity, while in cities in particular, they tend to be higher educated. Like you have investment banks versus, uh, you know, hair salons that would dominate elsewhere, for example. But in terms of what I have, I already have too much multicollinear already. And so in, in terms of the, of the econometrically, I can't get at that. However, the, the point, the question is, is, is dead on that within the service sector and various service sectors, educational attainment is going to play a role, uh, you know, because, uh, like I said, the, the people who couldn't remote work uh, and, the, and the people that firms don't hoard because they don't want to lose them is less skilled workers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, Ugo Rossi. Ugo is associate professor here uh, at GSSI. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for your uh, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have uh, basically two, two questions. Uh, first, uh, do you think it's uh, they're really comparable? This, this uh, economic, I would call it slowdown, perhaps rather than economic crisis, because the economy was uh, prior to the epidemic was very healthy. The economy of the United States, at least in terms of uh, standard indicators like uh, uh, employment and uh, jobs, you know. Uh, while the uh, the crisis uh, of uh, 2008 2009 was caused by very heavy household uh, debt. And it was uh, finance was involved, so it was really a major economic crisis uh, uh, caused by internal uh, problems, contradictions in the in the capitalist economy. You know, so I think they, they are quite. If you agree, I, I would like uh, would like to hear uh, if you agree on uh, this view that are quite two different uh, economic uh, uh, downturns. Uh, uh, this one and that of the late 2000. Uh, my, my second, uh, uh, so we can be, we should be in a way cautious uh, to, to compare this crisis, this economic slowdown to, to that of the late 2000s, as well as to famous uh, economic crisis like those of the 30s, for instance, you know, that was more similar perhaps to, to the one of the late 2000s. Uh, 
secondly, um, as this one is a service, uh, is, is a crisis impacting especially on uh, services. Before the, the, the epidemic, there the were uh, major debates on uh, uh, these issues of market power, of uh, concentration of market power in the hands of uh, a few high-tech uh, uh, um, corporations. Uh, um, and now we, we are facing a, a, a transition towards a, a kind of old delivery economy. So because of this, uh, this fact of being in lockdown, so delivery companies are uh, uh, acquiring uh, more power, you know? So there were there might be even more concentration of market power in the hands of these uh, of these uh, big uh, uh, of these high tech giants. You know, so I'm asking if in the in the United States there is uh, debates about uh, new regulations now. I mean, after the the crisis of the late 2000, the, uh, there was uh, a lot of debate on. Uh, regulating the mortgage sector, for instance, and the financial uh, sector. There is now a kind of comparable debate uh, towards uh, services, towards the service industry, and especially this shift towards an all delivery economy. What this implies in terms of market power concentration? Thanks. Uh, that those are uh, great questions. I'll uh, this reset. I don't know. I about the, this. It's going to be how fast will the supply chains come back together? And businesses, then you know, almost they all have to say together, we have confidence, and and, and they all come back at once. Or on the other hand, they're saying, I'm a little uncertain. I'm only going to I'm going to come back at fifty percent because I don't know. And if everybody's coming back at fifty percent, as an example, it's going to be really it's going to be a major major uh, depression that that potentially could last a long time. So the thing we don't know is how long will the supply? How long will confidence how much confidence will there be that the supply chain is ready to go that if i open up my doors i'll have suppliers and i'll have customers and 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 if people are a little bit afraid uncertain about that then then they won't come back full and we'll, we'll have a, a difficult one in terms of the causes uh you're right that finance one of the things that we did learn some things from the last crisis at least our central banks did uh, they, they, you know, the, nobody else learned, but our cent, you know, the, around the world, central banks learned that they needed to step in right away and much more aggressively. And here in the United States, the Federal Reserve has been incredibly aggressive. I think I have the numbers right. In the 2009 period, they were popping in around four uh, billion dollars a day into the money market, and in this, there were days in March that they were routinely putting in 125 billion. Uh, every day into the market to make sure that the credit markets held up. And even and in that, I just want to note that how close we came to a meltdown uh, that would have made th th that crisis, the earlier one look like nothing or the Great Depression. We were, even with $125 billion a day, our, our government bond market froze. And interest rates for, gov for governments to borrow money went like the 15 to 20 percent. And that, mar that market almost collapsed. It came, it was just uh, 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 hanging by a thread. And, and the other thing that we have is that uh, where we might get a financial problem still is the commercial, is what you described with your second question, is the commercial, uh, is the commercial re uh, real estate sector. You know, all these, you know, we, especially here in the United States, we have all these strip malls all over the place. And those things, because you mentioned the delivery economy, are uh, uh, are now worth less money because, you know, they're, they're, their businesses are, went out of business uh, they're being in, or they're being pressured by Amazon. And so we still could face asset value questions that we have, you know, so far we've avoided but we should still get that. And I would imagine Europe is also going to have problems with their commercial real estate sector as well. Uh, then the second question is in terms of market power. Yes, uh, in, in the U.S., in particular, uh, the evidence is that markups, price over cost, has risen much more in the United States than in Europe. 
and it, the, the economists generally the consensus is is not so much this has to do with the kind of businesses that we have today it has to do with the fact that the u.s no longer regulates market concentration uh and and so the answer to your question is one of the things that could happen a reform after this this event is that we might actually start getting regulation antitrust regulation of of large companies again and and that that would go against what you said that we you know we'll break break amazon up into multiple firms uh that uh will do the same with google uh or uh we just let them do, or they, you know i think we're either going to go from one extreme or to the other where we did, you know they've even become even bigger bigger behemoths uh so i don't know the answer to that uh because it, it's going to depend a lot on what will be the governmental response to that and it's in in the last 40 years in the u.s it's been hey, laissez fair capitalism okay thank you there is another question from fabiano compagnucci assistant professor here at the gssi Hi, Mark. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I would you. like uh, to know your opinion. In your opinion, uh, the pandemic could uh, boost uh, a relocation of some manufacturing activities uh, in the USA. And if so, uh, which ones and uh, uh, which state uh, could benefit from this relocation process? That's, that, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we went through a lot of people think it was a, a costly trade war, but uh, we've been going through a trade war with China, and and the initial steps of that is not a lot of that. So I'm talking about the trade war first. A lot of that so far is reshored, come back to the United States. Most of all that's been done is, is we shifted it from one low-wage country, China, to another low-wage set of countries uh, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, and so forth. Uh, the answer is uh, in terms of will the pandemic do that as well, and and, and I think there's going to certainly be a little bit, at least for a while, a temp at least a temporary nationalist response that we didn't uh, have uh, protective clothing for our medical professionals because uh, uh, we import a lot of that from Asia, and so there's going to be a movement to have to have that back on shore. Uh, but in other cases, uh, I don't think we're going to see a big change just because the cost advantages of buying the products in, from Vietnam, for example, are sufficient to offset the additional risk you have of your of your supply chain being disrupted by various events and we've had you know we had them the the, uh, the tsunami in japan really disrupted uh 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 japanese automakers and other kinds of components and, and people say oh we gotta we gotta we have to bring back our supply chain and not much happened so i i, I don't think it's going to have that effect in terms of where it's going to benefit uh, it's going to depend upon what, you, if we do get reshoring, it's going to depend upon what kind of industry and what kind of workforce you want. And if you don't really care about a high educated workforce, you know, you're going to, you're going to locate in the, in the American South. And, but if you do have, you want a higher educated workforce, you're going to locate, uh, you're going to locate in, uh, in Northern U S states. So it's going to depend a lot on the kind of work it is. Probably the southern states will benefit because the kind of things that will reshore are low wage manufacturing. So, long answer to that question, I <laughs> not really answering it. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, okay. If there are no other questions, I have two questions, um, and then we can continue. Someone uh, would like to raise some other questions. Um, First of all, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in what you present about, um, about the differences between um, heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity sectors, uh, 
uh, something that already mentioned Fabiano before. Um, and, and we have uh, some similarities uh, here. We are, we are doing a work with um, uh, Daniele Mantegazzi, that is also an assistant uh, postdoc here at the GSSI. We have a look at the um, entrepreneurship after natural disasters, so after the earthquake in L'Aquila. And we are seeing that, contrary to uh, what we expect, uh, at the very beginning of the crisis, so after the crisis, there were some sectors that were increasing in the, in the number of uh, opening a, a, an, a, an entrepreneur, basically. Um, this was related probably to a sort of, um, of um, a forecasting the, the, the government policies for the reconstruction. So we, we have seen a boom in, in the construction sector, for instance. Um, and my question is also related to this, because if you look at the pandemic, um, at the sector that are related to the business of pandemic in some sense, so they could experiment some, some boom in some sense. And, and my perception is that probably you, in, in your analysis, the, the sector that you are considering are maybe too aggregated. So in the sense, if you uh, have the possibility to go to a lower digit of uh, industrial sectors, probably you can find more more um, heterogeneity also in the response to the to the crisis. And, and the other point is that this is also that is also related to this one. My second question is the rural urban divide basically. Uh, you mentioned that that you have seen some differences uh, uh, in in the answer from from rural and urban areas, mainly because the sectors that are localized in the, in, in the two areas are different. So maybe rural areas are more um, essential services or essential firms or whatever. Um, so probably the interaction between rural uh, urban uh, localization and, and firms could could be something that you could explore and, and give some, some nice results. And, 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 and I don't know what you think about that. Uh, you're right that uh, uh, that's a, you, you raise a question that people a ask a lot, that there is heterogeneity uh, within sectors. And, and, I, it, it, and I think in terms of, first in terms of research, I think that'd be a great area to go if you have a good story to tell. Why? Mm -hmm doing it and if you have a good story I think it's I think it's great um, the next the next thing is in terms of entrepreneurship I I think that's the one I'm concerned about that at least in the United States that this interacting with the question that you know we had about Amazon and others uh, it, that they're going to be the ones that are crowded out and 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 we're going to get less of it here in the United States. And it's already been a problem that we've seen a, just a very large decrease in the number of new firm startups in the last 45, 50 years in the US, and it is continuing. And this pandemic might exacerbate that. Uh, though, uh, you know, one of the things that I haven't said that we that uh, potentially could make this way, way off is that we could get Schumpeter in uh, creative destruction. And uh, that that would open up all these new areas that new firms could come into that will finally get rid of the deadwood. And and one of the you know one of the complaints about this low, low, low interest rate environment we've been in since the financial crisis is that we have low interest rates and it keeps the zombie firms in business forever because they can keep borrowing money at low interest rates. And so, uh, if something could happen to get rid of some of those, then then my negative prediction would, would probably go away. Uh, we're going to have more opportunities open up and capital reallocate itself. So I, I'm not I'm not really sure. That's that's I'm more on the negative side right now, but but I, I definitely could go the other way. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we have another question, Eleonora Kokocha. She is a student uh, of us, uh, so Eleonora, if you would like Hi. to. Yeah. Okay. Great. I thank you for the presentation. It was very inspiring. Uh, um, more than a question, is a curiosity, uh, and maybe it's because I'm biased by the Italian, let's say, situation of workers. But uh, do you think that the situation would 
be even worse for the uh, low skilled workers because of also the Eleonora, we, we cannot hear you anymore. Uh, Eleonora? Eleonora, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, we, we, we no, lost okay. For, for, a, for a couple of minutes. Okay, oh. <laughs> I was... Um, okay. I could you, could you repeat then. your... Yeah, could you repeat your question, please? Yeah, yeah, I was saying that maybe I'm biased by the Italian situation, but I would like to know your opinion about the illegal workers that uh, are affected, of course, in this crisis because they do not receive also the uh, governmental uh, helps. And uh, uh, if you think that it would it could worst uh, the situation of uh, the low skilled uh, workers more than the high skilled. I, it, well, in the U.S., it's definitely going to do that, and it, but it is going to hit the uh, undocumented immigrants the hardest, in the sense that uh, they were they're skilled, and they're not getting any financial assistance for the most part, with a few little exceptions, and they're probably you know they're probably likely more. We've been uh, losing uh, uh, undocumented workers since the Great Recession. Uh, we had around 12 million, and I think we have less than 10 million now. And I think that trend that trend is going to continue because, for, you know, everything from uh, uh, Trump and and so on. In in terms of coming back to the low skilled workers, did it? Uh, here's a question: Did Italy do the program that they've done, like in the Netherlands and Germany and in the UK, where the where the government's pay, paying basically paying for the workers? Um, yes, the, okay. the, the Casa Integrazione, I don't know how you say it. <laughs> yeah. Right, pa right. Yeah, and I think that that's going to really relieve the burden for low-skilled workers because uh, firms would, keep, would not keep them on otherwise in the sense that you want to keep your highest skilled workers because when you, the economy improves, you don't want to have to find and reach train high skilled workers, but low skilled workers are more expendable. And if businesses are keeping them on because of this, then potentially uh, they're, they're not going to fare so bad. They're going to have a, they're going to have a relationship with the firm. And, and they, unlike here where they were just laid off, and so uh, I think our low skill workers will get hit a lot harder than yours. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we also have another question from YouTube. Uh, Gustavo uh, asks, um, to account for the uneven distribution of economic activity in space and account for differential effects of COVID-19 across states, do we need to use a theory of location to account for sorting pattern or pattern of firms? Use what? I'm sorry, Mr. Do we need to account for? Do we need to, to account to use a theory of location to account the sorting patterns of firms? Ah. Yes, we do need a location model. Uh, we, we do need a location model. Uh, Right now, though, uh, in terms of, you know, in the short run, what I'm looking at is, you know, we don't we don't need one because we've had an exogenous shock and nobody's had enough time to respond. However, uh, once firms do have time to respond, uh, then, yes, we're going to need a uh, theory of location. And, you know, the, you know the, where uh, uh, the, the key thing firms are going to move to is places that are going to provide more profitability. And I think in that, the, the question is, is I don't think this is going to matter. But if cities do get hit hard and as people say, oh, I don't want to live in cities, you know, certainly during this pandemic, New Yorkers, they they got out. I mean, if they, if they could afford it, they left New York. And uh, if, if that's the case, then I think that might start spreading. Uh, you know, that, that might have positive effects for rural areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, on that, I, I think, yeah, we do need a location model and uh, just to look at how this will, um, how this will uh, proceed. 
And at the moment, I have some opinions, uh, but that we just don't know. Okay. So great for researchers. Okay. We have now a, a question from uh, Adriana Carolina Pinate. She's a postdoc uh, here at the GSSI. Adriana? Adriana? Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes? Can yes? You hear me? No? Yes. Yes? Okay. Now we do. Okay. Okay. A uh, very, very interesting presentation. I have like a um, very quick question. And if, if it is possible to do your analysis in the other way. So, I mean, identify those sectors that can boost now the economy according to those changes that we are facing. So we can implement it, you know, to do the policies. So it, that in a second moment when the economy, you know, that boosts the economy to create spillovers among those sectors that, that are going to face, uh, like for example, tourists or services, as you say. So but there is a way that, I don't know, applying some econometric analysis or space analysis or identifies those sectors that we know that are more based on trade or on um, technology. So it, is this possible to do like to identify in, in the other way around that? Oh, that, that, that that's a good ones, question. Like that's a good question. That really going to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's all. <laughs> well, that's that's a really good question. It's been one that uh, oh, really since uh, uh, the 1980s has been really a high high priority. Uh, that well, if we could get you know, it's all high tech. Uh, if we could get high tech, or if we can get manufacturing, uh, or if we can get uh, uh, more insurance in certain places and so on, we're going to be very rapidly growing. And 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 one can, and I've done some of this. Is is now we have pretty good statistical methods that you know come up with well, what, what has the largest multipliers. You create one job in high tech, how many additional spillover jobs do you create and what kind of jobs they are. Uh, this is my take on it, is that policymakers are the last people I would ask for what's going to be the next big sector. And so I'm really skeptical of policies that we expect government and policymakers to identify what's going to be the next big sector. Because if they could do, because they have, not only do they need to be able to identify the next big sector, they also have to identify whether it could successfully locate in their place. So they got to, you know, they got to do first, they got to be the investment banker and figure out the best sector and then whether they can compete. And, and if they could do all those things, they really should be on Wall Street or, or you know, working in the financial markets because they're you know, they're omniscient, and so I, I I'm very skeptical that they could pick winners. Uh, rather, what I think is a better strategy is is that as I've said, you get the most bang for buck out of new firms and small firms. In other words, they're multipliers; they create more jobs per new job created than a large firm does because they're local. The money stays local. Uh, they tend to buy inputs locally, they, you know, those, those for those reasons. I would tend to, my policy idea would be to try to make it possible for small businesses to start up. Try to make a good climate for startups and let them figure out what's the best businesses to, to, to start up in. And I'll, I'll just add one other thing about that. Uh, I was fortunate to be involved with a study with Stefan Getz that we did where we looked at the 5,000 fastest growing firms in the United States and we're looking at where they started up and what caused them. You know, you know we, we found education really helps. But the thing that stood out was if you look at the 5,000 fastest growing firms is they located everywhere. They were in rural areas. They were in they were on the coast. They were all over. And then the next thing is, is you know how the media talks about all high tech or this or that. That's what we need. They were in all sorts of industries. They were in fertilizer and they were in you know, 
they were in distribution and they were in, you know, some very, you know, mundane sounding industries, yet that they were thriving. So my point is, is that, uh, uh, you know, let, let the entrepreneur decide what's going to be the growing industry because they're going to put their own money behind it. They, they, they're going to investigate it better, but create these circumstances such that they'll want to do it in your place. Is that, does that make sense? Yes, a lot, a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's not, you would say, not, not looking just a sector, but the measuring like a startup. So starting from giving to more small, medium firms that uh, the opportunity, so they create uh, a work that is more local, which is yep. should, okay, okay, yes, yes. Okay, perfect, yes, thank you. Yep, we found very large job multipliers. Yeah. You could use the economy of Italy, which is more <laughs> based on a small medium firm to see how to how to what's going on here to about it. Okay, thank you. Alessandra the um, one one final Fine, quick, very quick <laughs> and very quick and you know just a sense of it. So is uh, inequality, inequality going to grow again in the US and in Italy? And is it going to grow more in the US? Well, without major um, institutional changes, it's going to it's, it's going to grow more here in the US. And which is, which is somewhat uh, discouraging, because we have levels of inequality in the United States that are similar to Argentina of the 1920s, which was really high. So the answer is, yeah, we're going to, because we, we, our institutional arrangements uh, are uh, definitely favor the very, very wealthy. Okay, I think we, we have no more questions. Was was a really great pleasure to Having having you here, Mark. Um, the talk well, thank was you. inspiring because we, <laughs> I think we a lot of, of research will will be devoted in the future to to the consequences of uh, of the COVID because it's a huge 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 shock. Um, a lot I, of dissertations will be written. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I don't know. These these are some curiosity, but if it's something that happened also in Italy and you have a lot of heterogeneity also in terms of policy that have been applied in different, like the reopening of, of business sectors in Italy as being some, not, not driven by national policies, but regions would like to have some some force in, in, uh, in or power to, to have, uh, to give their the rule to reopening. So this this could, could lead to a lot of heterogeneity, but there is a lot, a huge, uh, work that is can be can be done as as the great recessions. I think there will be a, a boom in 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 this. Yeah, we'll be sick of COVID uh, uh, papers. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah, in the short <laughs> okay. term, it's going to be a great a great area for research. Okay, thanks a lot again. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Just a few moments to to say that the next uh, thank you that we will have will be just a second will be geopolitics of the knowledge based economy. It will be on on Tuesday, twenty twenty sixth of May at two p.m. and the chair will be Hugo Rossi. The, the speaker will be Sammy Moisio from University of Helsinki. So please follow also this webinar. And thank you all for, for, for being here and, and see you to the next seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.